Hi everyone, my name is Arun Venkatraman. I'm one of the founding engineers at Aurora and the lead of the motion planning machine learning team. I'm joined today by my colleague Sanjuman Chowdhury, and together we're going to talk to you about feedback and imitation learning. This is joint work with Brian Zebart, Jonathan Spencer, and Drew Bagnell, who's our chief technical officer at Aurora. And by the end of this talk, we hope to have addressed some of the confusion we've been seeing in the literature between causal confounding and feedback as it affects imitation learning. So let's get started. Imitation learning is no stranger in robotics. We've seen it being used from everything from teaching a robot how to play ping pong, um, with demonstrating how to hit the ball, how to fly a helicopter in acrobatic maneuvers that sometimes even outperform the expert by the end, um, how to take satellite images and navigate around them. But the application I want to focus on right now is the one in the bottom left, one of the oldest ones on this page. And that's the work by Dean Palmero in 1989, presented at New Europe's 1989, one of the first New Europe's conferences. On the left, you can see their self-driving platform. It looks a little bit clunkier than the self-driving cars we see today. Uh, but this platform was used as the basis for training out imitation learning on a real robot using just images to learn how to drive. So in a seminal work, uh, Palmero shows that we can take an image of that 32 by 32 camera feed um, from, a, from the car and learn to produce the steering angle as an output. So we have a neural network with 29 hidden units producing out 45 directional cases, so this is the steering angle, given the input of a, from just a camera. And this is a really cool piece of work and kind of like the basis of what a lot of what we do in today in imitation learning in robotics. Um, but what's really interesting is that in the paper, uh, Dean mentions a phenomenon that we're now very used to in imitation learning, we sort of take as one of the things we just need to always be correcting for when we're tackling this problem. And that is the problem of knowing how to correct from mistakes, right? So the network must not be shown only just examples of expert demonstrations of accurate driving. So this is the, the expert demonstrations showing it how to drive the vehicle, but it must also be shown how to recover. A learner is going to have some amount of error. It's going to make some mistakes. And then the network must be shown how to recover from those mistakes. And that is sort of fundamental to what we've been seeing in the literature across imitation learning from 30 years ago to now. Um, and it's just so interesting to see this show up that long ago, but still be so relevant to how, well, how we approach the problems today. And fundamentally, this comes uh, due to feedback, right? Is that our decisions have consequences. When we do supervised machine learning, uh, we, we assume that we have this sort of train and test problem where the train and test distributions are the same, um, or we hope they're the same. And at test time, we only make a single prediction and we're done. And at training time, we, we learn from a single, make a single prediction. At test time, we make that same prediction, right? But when we're doing something like imitation learning or any sort of sequential decision-making problem, so this could be like a natural language processing, we need to take the speech I'm saying and produce a caption on YouTube. Um, this could be in robotics, right? We want to predict the action to we take a forehand or a backhand when we're playing ping pong. Are, these actions have consequences. They change how we should respond in the future, but also change the state of the world. If I hit the ball or do I whiff the ball, right? These change the world in front of me. And the sort of feedback is ubiquitous in our problem, right? So there's obvious sources of feedback where the current action is directly a function of past, right? So if I'm taking uh, the ping pong example, if I'm learning to do a forehand, I don't want to, in between of that forehand, switch to a backhand. Or if I'm in a self-driving car and there's an internal combustion engine, it takes time for the compression to happen and for the energy to be released from the explosion of the gas vapors. This takes time. So therefore, I want to make sure that I still continue to command throttle so I take advantage of that power and not start with a throttle command and then immediately apply the brakes and get rid of it. So I want to make sure that the current actions are directly a function of the past actions sometimes. I want that hysteresis in my system. I want the smoothness or that continuity of behavior. But there are also less obvious sources of feedback. Is that fundamentally in our problems, our actions affect the future. They have consequences, right? If they didn't, we wouldn't be bothering to learn them. Um, so our actions will affect future states, right? If I decide to take this action, it's going to change how the future will evolve. And as I affect the future state of the system, that affects future features that I'm going to feed to the learner. And those future features then affect the future actions. And this happens ad nauseum, right? This is, there's a cyclic loop here where our actions affect states, our states affect features, and our features affect actions, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the cycle is feedback. It is just the feedback of our own decisions have consequences. Um, here's an example from the Aurora driver doing a nudge maneuver. So here we are nudging over to the side to give right of way to the oncoming vehicle. And you can see here that there's there's a lot of sources of feedback. So one is that as we decide that the, the driver should be yielding to the oncoming vehicle, it affects our future states. So as we decide to yield, we go to the side to give them right of way. And as a result, that affects those features, right? Our deviation from the lane feature is going to change, things like this. Um, any other features that we want to add to it, for example. 
But it's not just affecting the features of the AV, the self-driving car, relative to itself. It's also affecting its features of the world around it. The fact that we decided to yield meant the other actor's behavior also changed. So there's feedback coming in through the environment itself. Our actions affect what other actors are going to do, which then affect the features of those actors, which then affect our own policies that we are learning in the car. And this is another example of the Aurora driver taking an unprotected left turn. And again, our actions matter, matter, uh, matter. They affect how other actors around us will also respond. So as if you decide to be very aggressive on a turn, this will affect how other people decide to yield or not yield to us, um, which changes the features, which then changes how we should then respond on top of that. So there is feedback that naturally happens both in terms of internal to the robot itself, but also in how it responds with the world around it and how the world around it responds to it. So as an example, let's think of a self-driving car that's maybe we want to learn a policy that takes a bunch of state inputs and produces action. So let's say we go, we go to a test track, a race track or a test track of some sort, and we have the driver give us a bunch of expert demonstrations. So this is a human driver giving us a bunch of expert demonstrations going around the test track, and we collect a bunch of features like velocity, acceleration, pitch, so on. Um, we then want to use these features, these state inputs, to then produce actions. Let's say throttle and brake for the vehicle. So I want to throttle and want to brake on the vehicle. So then I go to go train my policy. So I have something like a neural network here where on the left side, I give it the features or the states as inputs. So this could be the raw, raw states themselves. This could be velocity acceleration. It could be derived things like sign of pitch. If you remember from high school physics, that's related to gravity. Um, and then we want to train it to predict the action on the right side, which is like throttle and brake. And given this policy now that maps us from states to actions, we can then go execute the policy, which means we take the policy we put on the robot and we execute to see what happens. We want to see what happens as we execute this policy. And what happens, and if I've been here, is that uh, you might get behavior that's not quite so comfortable as a human sitting in the car. Um, what you're effectively seeing here is that the learner is sort of uh, learning to sort of like fixate on little aspects of the state distribution um, from the training data and then how it slightly deviates at test time when you start to make a little bit of error. Um, so you might get things like, oh, we're going a little bit too slow. Let me reapply a lot more throttle to get, a, get there or I'm going a little bit too, too on a slightly different grade because I went on, on the turn a little bit differently. Okay, then I need to apply steering a little differently. And the result is often this very jerky or uh, non-smooth behavior that kind of makes you feel nauseous in the car. Um, not very good. So we can try to make this better by just adding more features, right? Better ingredients, better pizza. So we say as we add the past state and past action, say we want to sort of make the learner learn hysteresis. So we add past state, past action as features and wanted to learn a new policy. So we have on the left side, past state, past action, current state, and then we produce the current action. So we say, if we apply throttle in the past, we probably want to apply throttle again in the future. So there's some, there's some cause action here that we expect, to, expect there to be. And the result is, yes, we can often get rid of this sort of nauseating factor of like having non-split behavior. But often what will happen, as you can probably guess from this talk, is it doesn't quite work as expected. You, in fact, will be quite disappointed with the performance that, that you would get at the end. And to sort of walk through why this might happen, let's go through a, a simpler example than a self-driving car uh, that will sort of showcase the problem at, at hand. So here is a tooling pendulum where we apply the torque, the action that we want to take is applying torque at the middle joint, at the elbow of it. And the goal is to apply it in such a way that creates momentum that then swings it to the top. Um, and this is, a, this is one of these acro, uh, Acrobot simulators in OpenAI Gym. And what we do is we collect data from an expert where the expert itself is trained via reinforcement learning. So we use state-of-the-art Reinforcement learning to train an expert policy. So the expert knows how to solve this problem. And what we do is we want to train a behavior cloning policy on top of this. So behavior cloning specifically means that we want to mimic the expert. We want to clone that behavior of the expert, right? And we call this BC for short. So it's the type of imitation learning where we're just saying we want to then just directly mimic what the expert was doing given its state inputs. State is input, action is output. And being the good uh, machine learning uh, experts we are, we think about back to ML 101. And we know that we should not only just look at training loss, we should look at validation loss. So we take our expert data set, we split it up into a train and test set, where the, our validation set, where the validation is holdout, right? We've never seen this at training time. And you can see here by adding this extra information, right, um, more features, we in fact can lower our validation uh, error, which means we're actually doing better in validation, right? So it looks like everything's going well. We've added beta, we've added features, and everything's going well. We're doing better, supposedly. Um, but it doesn't really turn out to be doing so well in execution, right? So on the top, you can see what happens with regular behavior cloning. And in fact, not that smooth perhaps, but it's able to mimic the expert, right? It's building momentum and then able to swing the tip of the pendulum to the top. But at the bottom, 
Well, adding history or age, in fact, makes it worse. And in the past action, it makes it that we get, we get smooth looking behavior, but it's not, not at all doing the problem that we want to do. So it's not at all acting like the expert in any sense of the word. And this is fundamental in sort of how we think about machine learning and self-driving. Um, and not, not just, not just self-driving, but all of robotics, but we've seen this a lot in the literature in self-driving. So for example, this paper from Jan LeCun in Europe's 2005 talks about a system where they have this little truck platform, 50 centimeter truck platform, and they're learning end to end to go from images to how to avoid obstacles. And what they found is that by adding history of successive frames or future past frames of the image, the robot would just learn to, to turn in circles or what they characterize as catastrophic behavior. The robot just could not learn to do anything other than predict based on what it had already done in the past. Um, exactly the thing we were kind of seeing here with the pendulum, it's not really doing anything. It's just like, like mimicking what it was doing in the past. And our observation here is that feedback drives covariate shift. Like one of the fundamental issues that we talk about in imitation learning is that the distributions change between train and test. And this is driven by the fact that the feedback issue is driving this covariate shift. And that's our observation. So taking a code of a classical example that uh, Drew often presents when he talks about this is that uh, we might take an input such as this camera image and we want to learn to predict the output. So we have this game like Mario Kart, um, Super Tux on Linux. Um, and we want to make sure that we drive on this rainbow road without falling off. So we're going to predict the output of steering angle left or right to, to solve this problem. And we collect a bunch of expert demonstrations. Here was done by uh, one of my former uh, colleagues in grad school, uh, Stefan Ross, where he just demonstrated a lot of times how to drive on this. And he's very good at this game. So here's what happens when you run the supervised learning approach on this. So you collect a bunch of data. You then train these sort of like state action pairs, as we talked about before, to generate a policy to drive the car. And you can see that very quickly the car drives itself off the road. So it starts a little bit looking OK, and then gets itself into a state where it doesn't know what to do, and then drives off the road. And this is, this is what's illustrated on the, on the left here. So the orange is the expert demonstration, drives in the center of Stefan's very good at video games. But then at test time, the learner just starts to deviate slightly, and over time just deviates catastrophically off the road. right? And there's no training data or how to recover from this, because the expert just demonstrated how to drive perfectly. Just, just if you were, in fact, able to copy the expert perfectly, this would be irrelevant. You're able to only go to those states. Um, and one of the key insights here was that, very much like what Dean found, is that you can leverage the interactive demonstrator. So if you can query the expert to correct from your mistakes, you can actually provably do well. And this algorithm was called DAGR, or Dataset Aggregation. That provably shows that by doing such a thing, we can actually guarantee performance improvements. So again, iteration one is exactly the thing we talked about. You get some demonstrations, you get a data set, you train your policy. Then when you execute the policy, what you do now instead of just watching yourself fall off the road is you go back and ask the expert, what would you have done instead now that I got here? So as you're starting to go off the road, the expert will tell you, really turn left, really turn left, really turn left. And that's what the expert gives you is that as we go into those other states, we get this feedback of exactly what we should be doing to try to correct ourselves. What we do is then we take this and we add it to the previous data. And this is the data set aggregation phase. And what we do is we just repeat this again and again, where we collect new data from the current policy Add it to the previous data. So again, we want to be robust against all the states we've seen so far. So we keep it the new data and old data. We aggregate them, and we train a new policy. And this is provably a good algorithm to do. Um, you can look at the paper for the proof, but you can show that this, in fact, has bounded sort of error. Uh, so the simplest variant of this is forward, but there's been many variants um, of Dagger that have been produced over the years, H Jagger, Ensemble Dagger, and so on. Um, and active learning methods have all understood the, the use of finding sort of interactive demonstrations. Is that as I'm training these sort of policies and sort of sequential decision-making problems, I need the ability to query an interactive demonstrator in order to do better. But the question is, do we need expensive interactive demonstrators? And provably or theoretically, the answer is yes. Um, that's the way that we know how to correct ourselves once we deviate from the distribution of states that the expert has shown us. But it can be expensive and impractical. If you have to wait for the self-driving car to get itself stuck in the mud in order to then ask the expert how to recover from the mud, that's kind of expensive on the robot. Um, querying the expert itself can be expensive or even difficult. Um, the expert will have to give advice in states they never visit. They have to know how to respond once, they, once you've got yourself stuck, right? So if you're uh, almost about to fly off the edge of the world in the video game, the human may be like, There's, I don't know how to do this. I've never done this myself, right? Um, but most of us have if you ever played Mario Kart before. Um, but fundamentally, one of the things we've noticed practically is that it's often difficult when you're not in situ, when the person's not physically in the vehicle driving, for you to demonstrate it. So like in the, in the Mario Kart video, the demonstrations were given after the fact. So you collect the logs, the data, then you go demonstrate it afterwards. And what we found practically is that 
in that problem or in self-driving or other robotics domains, uh, let's say you're controlling a robot arm, it's often hard to do it after you've collected the data. Since you haven't, you're not there to sort of get the intuition of how to explain what the correct answer is. It's not really the same as being there in the moment, you know, feeling the accelerations. If you're in the car, feeling the accelerations in your body and so on and so on. So the question is, if we know we need interactive experts, how are we done? Well, it'd be nice to think about this problem in a way, in a framework that lets us now address this problem in a way that's more fundamental than having to say we must always just go back to get an interactive expert. So fundamentally, we sort of have to. There might be other ways we can help to think about this problem that alleviate this problem at some level. And one thing we've seen in the literature more recently is this claim that this is related to sort of confounding in causality or causal confounding, as it's called in statistics literature, um, which is that the dependencies on our actions and states are coming through as confounders in our problem where we are learning, we are unable to learn the true causative nature because of confounding. And this shows up in a couple of different ways. So going back to why feedback really shows up in this machine learning problem in self-driving problems is, for example, in this paper, imitating driving behavior with GANs is that they found that the policies can just, uh, develop an over-reliance on previous actions, and their approach was just to not include them in the data set. This has been one approach that we've seen in the literature. Um, another one, this is Way this is from Waymo in December 2018, Shafarnet, which they learned that the network can learn to cheat by just extrapolating from the past. For example, you're coming to a stop at a traffic light, the network can learn to just copy that behavior and say, for stopping, I should just keep stopping, instead of really learning about how, what to do, what to do next. Um, so all in all, this this is just ways to kind of get around this problem. And here's another example, which is where uh, we are creating a spurious correlation between low speed and no acceleration. And this is effectively making it hard for the learner to then learn how to recover again once it comes to a stop. So again, we're seeing this concept of where having sort of previous states. So in this, in this paper, they predict future velocity, but as an input feature, they also give uh, previous velocity and acceleration. And as a result, it makes it hard for the learner to sort of recover once it comes to a stop. Um, and finally, the paper that I think tries to really address this sort of more fundamentally and is, it gives an example of where we have a human trying to come to a stop for a pedestrian. And when they hit the brake pedal, it turns on the brake indicator on the dashboard, right? So this is clearly a feedback issue. As I hit the brake pedal, it causes the indicator to show up. Um, but in reality, the human is trying to stop for the pedestrian, but the learner will instead say, if the brake light is on, I should come to a stop, right? So the feedback issue is manifesting itself as saying there's a high correlation between this dash light indicator and the actuator hitting the brake. When in reality, the person is the one that's actually sort of causally causing it, right? So intuitively, one may call this sort of causal confusion or causal, causal misidentification, but fundamentally it comes because of this feedback issue, right? My brake pedal affected the brake lights showing up. Um, and the argument that's given in this paper is that uh, the result of what's happening here is that there's a distributional shift, distributional shift. Our past actions are influencing the state variables, also maybe the current actions. Um, in this case, it was the dashboard, right? So it's kind of like a state variable. It's affecting the state of the dashboard, the light variable is turning on. And the result is that at test time, the imitator is paying attention to this and causing a distributional shift with respect to the expert, right? And the result is that by paying attention to the brake light, we're not going to break until the brake light is on, which means we won't break for the pedestrian instead. Um, and they define this as what they call as semantically causal misidentification, which might sound sort of semantically correct, but using the sort of uh, statistical framework of causality and thinking about it in terms of causal confounding is not quite maybe the right way to think about how we should approach this problem or not the right framework to try to approach it. So I'm going to now hand it over to my colleague, Sanjuman Chowdhury, to try to give us an example of what might be a potential framework that one could use instead to think about this. And, more related to how even this paper talks about its distributional shift. And with that, I'll hand it over to Sanjuman. Thank you. Thanks, Arun. So uh, let's pick up the story where Arun left off. Uh, we saw that adding past actions as features led to behavior cloning failing. Uh, we would recover policies that heavily depended on the past action. Dehan et al. correctly note that this creates a distributional shift, which is of principal concern. However, they attribute this to a failure of causal reasoning that the past state actions uh, act as a confound between the current state and action. Uh, they use this rationale to present a very effective method of deselecting features to undo such effects. However, uh, two things are unclear. Number one, are past actions really a confound? Uh, number two, do they necessarily have to be deselected? 
let's begin with point number two. Uh, there are many cases where past actions do indeed affect future actions. Uh, take the example where experts may smoothly change their actions over time or have some amount of hysteresis. In this case, future actions are constrained to be similar to the previous action. Uh, this is also very common in NLP, where translation of a given word in a sentence depends on the translation of the previous word. In fact, in a general MDP, the past action may affect all the states in uh, SD1 uh, plus 1 equally. Um, so it's unclear if feature selection will really help in, in such cases. The other point that was made was that past actions uh, act as a confound. Uh, now, this contradicts with the technical definition of uh, confound as put forward by Perl. Um, all the nodes in this graphical model are observed. Uh, that is the states and actions. Um, there are no latent variables. So if you were to go ahead and compute the interventional probability, uh, P S T plus 1, condition on do um, STAT. This turns out to be equal to the observational probability. Um, so this equality implies that the graph is unconfounded. And uh, if we had infinite data and excitation, we would in fact recover the correct weights for the graphical model. Uh, we note that this um, fact also holds in all the experiments that were presented in the paper uh, where all variables were observed. So uh, we claim that causal confounding, at least in the sense of Pearl, Glimmer, and Jewel, cannot be the root cause for the observed poor in-situ performance. That being said, we'll note that uh, cases with real latent confounders is a pressing issue uh, that may be more difficult to handle and requires a separate in-depth discussion. So let's take a step back. We have plenty of anecdotal evidence that behavior cloning works really well until it fails dramatically when one, when one runs into the problem of feedback. Only those familiar with feedback who carefully choose features and monitor institute performance can play in this field. And uh, much of this may just be an artifact of finite data. Instead, let's take a look at the infinite data limit to clearly understand what's going on. We claim that uh, feedback causes a spectrum of covariate shift problems. If you're lucky, you find yourself in the easy, realizable setting where the demonstrator is in our policy class. So with infinite data, behavior cloning will give us the, a policy that manages to hit Bayes' error everywhere. So there's no need to do anything fancy. Just go get more data. On the other hand, you have hard problems where the demonstrator is not realizable. Moreover, the learner leaves the data support. So even with infinite data, the learner ends up in these novel states that have no labels and continues making errors, eventually hitting an OT square error. Now, your only recourse is to query interactive demonstrators, which Arun was talking about earlier. But there are these interesting problems in the middle where the demonstrator is not realizable, but has full support. So you can still do behavior cloning, but you won't drive down to Bayes' error. You get this suboptimal performance because the data is not uniformly concentrated on the test distribution. Right? So this suggests a very simple fix. Use an interactive simulator to construct the test distribution. Uh, we can then adjust for this covariate shift and eventually achieve optimal OT error rate. OK, so this is a key idea. Uh, prevent and adjust for covariate shift without needing to query an interactive uh, demonstrator. Okay, how do we do this? How do we correct for the change in distribution if we don't know what that distribution is going to be? Uh, this is where the simulator comes in. Uh, we unroll the learner forward in time, use the simulator to recursively build the induced density, and then correct for or uh, try to prevent uh, distribution mismatch. So we call our framework ALICE, which stands for Aggregate Losses to Imitate uh, Cached Expert. Conceptually, ALICE interleaves two processes. Uh, ALICE uses a simulator and rolls in the learner to generate samples. It then uses these samples and samples from cache demonstration to construct a loss. Uh, this loss is set up in a way that it counters or adjusts for covariate shift uh, between these distributions. The policy is then updated and the process repeats. Now, the key thing is that we are not using an interactive demonstrator. We are using cached demonstrations. The loss is where all the work happens. It's dynamically adjusting to new samples from the simulator as the learner keeps on changing. So how do we compute this loss? There are several options. We'll talk about two. 
Uh, one last is to still do classification, but adjust for covariate shift by computing the density ratio between the test and train distribution. So we take samples from the simulator and the demonstration, use our favorite density ratio estimator, reweigh the data, and then solve the classification problem. Another loss is to instead counter the covariate shift by trying to match moments of the next state. So we can simulate different actions, get next state samples, take corresponding demonstration samples, compute our favorite moments, and try to match them. So we have this very familiar circular problem, right? Um, the loss depends on the policy, which in turn depends on the loss. Fortunately, we can solve this problem exactly if we unroll Alice forward through time. So let's take a look at what, uh, how to do this. Uh, so at t equal to zero, we have only the initial distribution, no covariate shift. So do behavior cloning and get a policy for only this time step. At t equal to one, we have policy pi naught and we have a simulator. We can exactly sample from the test distribution by rolling in this policy. Um, now we have to compute an adjusted loss uh, using these simulated samples and the cache demonstration. Uh, once we have this adjusted loss, we can train a new classifier to minimize the loss and get the next policy by one. Again, the same thing repeats as step, uh, at time step t equal to two. So this time we roll in with policy pi naught and then pi one, compute the loss, train a new classifier to get a new policy pi two. And this keeps repeating at every time step. Um, and by recursively computing the uh, test distribution, Alice uh, achieves the OT error rate. Now, practically, we may not want different policies for every time step. In this case, we can switch to the iterative version of Alice. Uh, this works very much like the dagger framework that Erwin talked about. At iteration n, we roll in with the current policy. This rolled in data and cache demonstrations are used to create a loss. The key thing is to aggregate this loss with all the previous losses and then train a classifier on the aggregated data to get a new policy and, and keep repeating this. Okay, uh, so we evaluated Alice on the Acrobot problem that Arun showed previously. Uh, when history is added as a feature, uh, both behavior cloning and Alice are able to drive the validation error, which is shown on, uh, in the plot on the left, but Alice actually does well in execution time, unlike behavior cloning, as shown in the plot in the middle. In fact, uh, Alice does better than behavior cloning uh, without the added history feature, which means it's able to use history to its advantage. And this is really the key takeaway. History can be a powerful feature if used while properly adjusting for covariate shift. Okay, so as we come to a close, it's natural to ask, how does this inform us in dealing with real world problems? Well, it's encouraging to know that there are cases where even when we do not have an interactive human demonstrator, we can get by using a simulator. Um, recent times, we've seen an explosion of simulators that are high quality, that are open source and easy to work with. Uh, these are just some of the handful of examples out there. At Aurora as well, we, uh, we rely on strong simulation infrastructure to turn on-road logs into simulations, uh, as shown in the video uh, in the middle. Um, we've seen that over time, these simulations cover more and more diverse scenarios that allow the planner to really explore the space of events that can occur. Okay, so in summary, uh, we talked about feedback, how it's pervasive in imitation learning and examples of how it leads to covariate shift. Uh, the key challenge is to manage this covariate shift. To that end, uh, to that end we introduced a spectrum of problems. Uh, you have these easy problems where all you have to do is behavior cloning. The demonstrator is realizable, and with more data, behavior cloning works fine. For hard problems, you really have no choice. You need an interactive demonstrator as in Dagger to tell the learner what to do in truly novel situations. But for problems in the middle, uh, covariate shift is an issue, but we don't need an interactive demonstrator. Right? As we showed in Alice, we can leverage simulation to correctly construct the, the, the test distribution. And then we can use the, the, this distribution to either prevent um, or um, adjust for covariate shift. Now, um, another thing to note is that uh, when we have finite da data, even the easy problems uh, that we talked about can become much harder. And, and covariate shift may manifest. And um, 
and, and such problems may benefit from the Alice framework. Finally, this all of this stuff was about feedback. Causal confounding is distinct from feedback. While it can manifest as covert shift, in which case the spectrum is applicable, um, if there are truly latent causes, that might be much more difficult to handle. Uh, thank you very much.